Uh, my name is Amanda Sheldon. I'm the Vice President, President of Marketing and Communications with the FH Foundation. And I'm pleased to begin our LP Delay 101 session with you tonight. This webinar is not intended to be um, medical advice and um, it is it is being recorded and um, we will make it available on demand for everyone following this program. And um, it's, it's really our aim is to empower you with the education and knowledge that you need to make your most informed decisions about your healthcare. So as we've already mentioned, please at the bottom of the screen, go ahead and say hello. Um, and make sure to choose the second box that says panelists and attendees so all the attendees can see it as well. And we'll be taking questions at the end of the um, presentation through the Q&A feature. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to enter in your questions because the chat goes just too quickly for all of us to be able to spot your questions from within that. And thank you to everyone who have already sent in your questions. We've really used that to inform our presentation tonight and make sure that we're covering all the basics of LP Delay. And so now um, I'd also like to thank the generous support of our inaugural foundation level sponsor, Amgen, as well as all of our families and um, individuals who support the work of the FH Foundation. We couldn't do this without your generous donations. And now I'd like to introduce Catherine Wildman, the founder and CEO of the FH Foundation. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome everyone. Um, we're so happy to be able to share this evening with you. Thanks for making the time. I wanted to start, some of you I see, I already know, and you know that we have as an organization for the last 10 years done a tremendous amount of work in the field of familial hypercholesterolemia and over the last three years have been doing an increasing amount in the field of LP little a. And I just wanted to share my story briefly because I think it illustrates an underlying set of problems um, that we're all facing if we have elevated LP little a. I had a heart attack at the age of 38, for those of you who don't know, and um, I do have familial hypercholesterolemia, but it took me about nine more years to understand that I also had elevated LP little a. And elevated LP little a is a metabolic disorder that occurs in one in five people in the general population, but is even more prevalent in the familial hypercholesterolemia population. And this is a very exciting time because I think we're learning a lot more about how it's a driver of cardiovascular disease. And as Dr. McGowan will share with you, there actually um, are therapies on the horizon that might be able to um, dramatically help reduce that risk. But I was looking at this old slide and noticing that LP little a was invisible, although I was born with it um, and thought that that really captured the issue that, that LP little a is invisible and together we hope to address that. So let's go to the next slide. So we, this is such a great slide. It really shows what are the, the major causes of death in the United States of America and what do people search for on Google and what does the media report on? and there's a discrepancy. Um, we see that heart disease is sadly the number one cause of death, not by much, but just beating out cancer. If you look on the left-hand column here, um, at about 30% of deaths would be attributed to cardiovascular disease, where it's about 29% to cancer. But if you look at the, in the next column to the right, you see that what people search for and what that reflects is what's on their mind. What are they concerned about? It's cancer. And then there are other um, causes of death. And only about 2% of individuals are searching for information on cardiovascular disease. The media has a similar bias where cancer is um, covered to quite a large extent, as is suicide and homicide. Um, and heart disease is barely mentioned. And that's really 
a key part of what the FH Foundation intends to do always with our work is to elevate the profile of heart disease and educate all stakeholders, including those who are at highest risk or already, or already have heart disease about what they can do um, to delay the progression or delay the onset of an MI or hopefully prevent it altogether. Next slide. And the way that the FH Foundation has done this over the last 10 years is to aggregate a large amount of data to answer unanswered questions. We have a national registry um, that is focused on familial hypercholesterolemia, but within that, we also collect data on LP little a, and we also have a very large healthcare encounter database that we publish off of. And this data is imperative to bring to policymakers, to payers, to health systems, to physicians, to help change care. Um, and to really demonstrate the gaps that currently exist in care. We also bring the medical expertise as we're gonna be doing this evening with Dr. Mary McGowan and many of the other physicians that we work with on our board of directors, our scientific advisory board and the principal investigators in some of our large studies. And we elevate your voice. So if you have questions or you have struggles um, share those with us because that's one of our goals is to be able to show some of these policymakers what your experience is and um, to address the gaps that you may be experiencing in care. Next slide. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary McGowan. She was actually our first chief medical officer, so we're so happy that she is back with us in that role. She also was one of our first members of the board of directors um, and really played an instrumental role in the formation of the FH Foundation. She is the co-director of the Lipid Clinic at Dartmouth Hitchcock Heart and Vascular Center and um, a lipidologist and expert in lipid disorders, including um, elevated LP little a. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much, Catherine. And welcome to everybody. Could I have the next slide? So today we're gonna to talk about lipoprotein little a, LP little a 101. And I can assure you, um, uh, 102 will be coming soon. Um, and I, I wanna say at the beginning, LP little a is a pretty complex lipoprotein. And so if you don't, uh, get everything as I'm talking today, um, feel free to go back. This, this webinar is going to be posted on our website, um, but I, I'll try to speak slowly, that's not my strong suit. And um, we'll talk about all of these things, but I do wanna get time for your questions. So hopefully we'll um, move things along and um, get to answer some of those questions. So first of all, um, LP little a is different than LDL um, and the FH Foundation has focused on LDL, um, but from our inception, we have also focused on LP little a. And as Catherine mentioned, many people who have familial hypercholesterolemia, which is really a disorder of very elevated LDL, also have uh, elevated LP little a. And so we'll, we'll talk about that as well, but tonight's focus is really lipoprotein little a. So we're going to talk about what is lipoprotein little a, how commonly is it elevated, and we're going to ask the question, why might lipoprotein little a be a risk factor for heart disease, stroke, and aortic valve calcification, or we could say aortic valve stenosis or blockage? How is LP little a inherited, and how do we diagnose elevated LP little a levels, um, and are there any therapies currently available, and will there likely be th therapies that uh, will come um, down the pike soon. Um, then we'll leave some time for some questions. Uh, next slide. Um, so what is lipoprotein little a? Next slide. So um, Amanda, who um, introduced us um, tonight, um, Amanda Sheldon's husband is a, an artist and he drew this rendition of LP little a. So this is lipoprotein little a. And I like to think of lipoprotein little a as being LDL with a twist. Um, with in some ways a diabolical twist. Um, but as you can see right here in the core of this um, uh, model of lipoprotein little a is actually LDL. LDL is a um, cholesterol rich particle, lipoprotein, that has a single 
apoprotein on it, ApoB100. But LP little a is more than just LDL. Uh, attached to the ApoB by something called a disulfide bond, which you can see up in the corner here, um, is the ApoA. Um, and that Apo protein confers additional properties that we'll go over. Um, so LDL is a lipoprotein that can clog arteries, can block arteries. Um, LP little a is going to have additional properties based on the fact that it APOA is another, um, another protein that may increase the risk of clotting. And I'll also draw your attention to um, this little spiked, like um, orange spiked, like um, lipoprotein or, or oxidized phospholipid in the, in the upper right hand corner. That is attached to uh, APO lipoprotein A as well. And we know now that oxidized phospholipid may confer additional properties on LP little a, such as increasing the risk of inflammation. Next slide. So how common is elevated LP little a? Catherine alluded to this in her introduction. Um, we consider an LP little a level as elevated if it's greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter or greater than 125 nanomoles per liter. And LP little a is kind of unique in terms of lipoproteins in that you can measure it in um, two different ways. Measured as in mass or 50 greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter being elevated is considered mass and nanomoles per liter um, is considered particle number. Um, over time, um, we believe that the milligrams per deciliter um, measurement will go away and nanomoles per liter will take um, precedence. But for right now, um, when you're looking at your lab report, you have to know um, whether it's in milligrams per deciliter or nanomoles per liter, because that makes a difference in terms of whether or not um, it's elevated. So one in five people worldwide has an elevated lipoprotein little a. This is much more common than familial hypercholesterolemia that occurs in one in 250 people. If we do the math, um, it is 1.4 billion people worldwide. I will tell you at this moment in time, most do not know that they have an elevated LP little a. In my opinion, everybody deserves a lipoprotein little a measurement at least once in their lifetime. And it's our mission at, at the FH Foundation to expose this, to educate on lipoprotein little a, such at, in much the same way we've done on FH, so people know what their LP little a is and know to ask their physician um, for an LP little a um, measurement. Next slide. So um, LP little a is a risk factor. Next slide. So this is a very nice um, uh, uh, diagram that came from um, uh, Dr. Wilson's paper in uh, the Journal of Clinical Lipidology, um, looking at lipoprotein little a and its pathogenic um, uh, mechanisms. So um, we've added um, something for the lay people. Lipoprotein little a causes clogging and clotting. I think that that's a good way to think about this. Clogging meaning increases the risk for atherosclerosis and clotting meaning that it can increase the risk of, of blood clots in our, in our bloodstream. Um, so let's take the atherosclerosis part. Um, because of the uh, LDL portion of lipoprotein little a, we all know that LP little a um, has the LDL portion and that can increase the risk of atherosclerosis, blocking our heart arteries, arteries that lead to our brain, so it could increase the risk of stroke, um, other arteries in our legs, our arms, um, and also can get into that the cholesterol um, from uh, the um, LDL portion of lipoprotein little a can get into the aortic valve leaflets. The aortic valve is typically a tri-leaflet valve, and you can see that in the lower right-hand corner. And, in, in those leaflets, um, we can get cholesterol, and that is a negative thing um, because it can increase um, the stiffness of the aortic valve. We also know um, that that oxidized phospholipid that I talked about may actually um, increase the risk of calcium getting into the aortic valve. And we all want calcium in our bone, but we certainly don't want calcium in our aortic valve because um, that would make it very stiff and difficult to get blood out of the heart. 
Moving to the left-hand side of this slide, um, LP little a can increase the risk of thrombosis. Um, so the apolipoprotein A portion of LP little a um, is, is very much like a, in some ways, a clotting factor. So the apolipoprotein portion mimics something that we all have in our bloodstream called plasminogen. Plasminogen is inactive, but it gets converted to plasmin. And plasmin is what breaks down our fibrin-rich clots. So all of us have this interaction going on in our body and our body for, for most people is really, really efficient at making sure that we can clot where we need to and not clot where we don't need to. Um, but um, the apolipoprotein A portion um, actually impairs the ability of plasmin to break down fibrin rich clots. And so you can imagine if there's a plaque in an artery, a heart artery, and it ruptures and you get a, a clot on top of it, that spells um, a, a heart attack unless we can break down that clot. Next slide. Um, so how does LP little a increase the risk of heart disease, stroke, and aortic valve stenosis? And um, here I hope um, repetition is our friend. Um, I've already said some of this. Um, so there is a strong observational, meaning when we see people who have high LP little a, they may be at greater risk and seem to be at greater risk for cardiovascular events. And genetic evidence, and this is through something called Mendelian randomization studies, genetic evidence that um, there is a causal relationship between elevated LP little a and the increased risk of heart disease, stroke, and aortic valve disease. And this involves all components of the lipoprotein little a. So lipoprotein little a, we've talked about, it's composed of an LDL-like particle, it's composed of apolipoprotein A, and oxidized phospholipids. The LDL component is atherogenic, locks up arteries. The apolipoprotein component is thrombogenic, so possibly promoting blood clots. And that oxidized phospholipid promotes inflammation, and as we'll see in a later slide, may actually add calcium to our aortic valves. Next slide. So why might an elevated LP little a cause cholesterol deposition in the arteries? So atherosclerosis of the arteries or the aortic valve leaflets. So atherosclerosis um, in the arteries involves cholesterol deposition in the arterial intima. The intima of the artery is the, the lining of the artery that's closest um, to the blood. So it's the inner layer of the arteries and um, cholesterol likes to get into that in inner layer. Then um, aortic valves, um, you can get cholesterol deposition within the valve leaflets. In general, one third of LP little a's mass is cholesterol. So for the next slide, a rough rule of thumb to determine the amount of cholesterol for any given LP little a measure in milligrams per deciliter is to divide that LP little a by three. So here's an example. If a person has a normal LP little a level, 30 or less, and so let's just do 30 because I can divide 30 by three easily. Um, if somebody has an LP little a um, level of 30, um, the cholesterol content would be 10 milligrams per deciliter. Um, so 30 divided by three, 10. This is unlikely to cause any significant degree of atherosclerosis. But how about if somebody has a much higher LP little a, an LP little a of say 240, um, this will contribute 80 milligrams per deciliter of cholesterol. And this may be enough to contribute significantly to the development of cholesterol deposition in the arteries and the aortic valve. Next slide. So then what if my LP little a is measured in nanomoles per liter? And some of you that are listening tonight will have an LP little a measured in nanomoles per liter. And what I'm gonna give you here is just a rough rule of thumb. Um, so a rough rule of thumb would be to divide nanomoles per liter by 2.5 to get milligrams per deciliter. And I want to stress that what you're really, you're comparing apples and oranges. Milligrams per deciliter is mass, nanomoles per liter is particle number. For a back of the on, uh, envelope estimate, it does work. Um, so you divide by 2.5 and you have your, what, what your LP little a is in milligrams per deciliter. Then divide that by three and you'll get the cholesterol contribution. Next slide. 
So here's a little bit of a tricky slide, but I've already alluded to it. So um, the APOA portion um, of LP little a shares structural hom homology with plasminogen. That means that they sort of evolve together. And I've mentioned what plasminogen is. What you can see on the left-hand side of this slide is a depiction of plasminogen. Plasminogen is an inactive precursor to plasmin, and plasmin is a really potent protein involved with the breakdown of fibrin clots. And apolipoprotein A interferes with this process. So um, here, when you're looking on the left-hand side, um, you'll see K1 through K5. Um, and this really stands for Kringle 1 through Kringle 5. And for those of you who are Danish, um, you'll know um, that a Kringle is a Danish pastry. And um, the discoverers of plasminogen said that these Kringles look like a Danish pastry. So they called it Kringle 1 through Kringle 5. They have to have a little fun. And um, what has evolved for APOA is just Kringles 4 and 5 are part of APOA. And here it's a little tricky because we are using the Roman numeral 4. And so Kringle 4 for um, apolipoprotein A has greatly expanded. And it has Kringle 4, um, but it has 10 types of Kringle 4. And in a moment, I'll focus on um, Kringle 4 type 2. Um, and then there's also Kringle 5 that you can see at the very, um, right next to what's being called a protease um, and right next to the oxidized phospholipid. So Kringle 4 type 2 is really what expands a person's level of LP little a, expands or, or makes it lower. So um, you can have a tremendous variation in the number of Kringle 4 type 2 repeats. Um, anywhere from two copies to 40 copies. And you get different copies from each of your parents. So um, LP little a can really have a tremendous um, difference in amount that you have in the bloodstream. So next slide. Um, so the how might LP little a increase clotting? And we've already talked about this, but the apolipoprotein A portion of LP little a might promote thrombosis at vulnerable sites in a plaque. And so you can see here, um, depicted in the gray, is where a plaque might um, occur. Um, but if that plaque ruptures, um, we'll get a clot on top of it. And so increasing the risk of um, heart attack and also increasing the risk of what's called thrombotic emboli. Little pieces of the plaque can, or from the, uh, of the clot can break off and could get to our um, carotid arteries in our neck and increase the risk of a stroke. Next slide. So here's, this is a little bit of a tricky um, slide, but talking about inflammation. And so I've already talked a little bit about oxidized phospholipids. Oxidized phospholipids are found bound to apolipoprotein A, and they might um, help explain LP little a's potential harms. Oxidized phospholipids, as you could see from the um, very nice um, schematic that uh, Scott Sheldon drew, um, they, they co-localize, they attach to apolipoprotein A, both in the arterial and valvular lesions when cholesterol gets into the artery or the valves. And they may participate in the pathogenesis of these disorders by promoting a whole host of things. For one, endothelial dysfunction. So endothelial cells are the single layer of cells that line our artery walls. And when they're dysfunctional, um, they might not dilate. We count on our endothelial cells. Say if you want to run down the block, we count on our endothelial cells for dilating and allowing more blood to flow through um, your heart arteries to get more blood, more oxygen to your, your heart, which is a muscle. In, in dysfunction, um, they may not, not dilate um, appropriately, and so we might not get the blood flow that we need. Oxidized phospholipid might be able to participate in lipid deposition, and we clearly know that it's inflammatory. And then this osteogenic differentiation of valvular interstitial cells. Now that sounds like a mouthful. Um, so the interstitial cells, they're cells that are um, part of the valve leaflet itself. And the um, oxidized phospholipid might promote um, the interstitial cells to collect calcium or, or to um, 
become calcified. And this means that the valve cells behave more like bone cells. And as I've said, we want um, calcium in our bones, but we certainly do not want it in our um, aortic valves. Next slide. So how is LP little a inherited? Next slide. Lipoprotein little a is inherited as an autosomal dominant or autosomal co-dominant disorder. Um, or fashion. Um, so what is an autosome? Um, we have autosomes as chromosomes and we have sex chromosomes. The autosomes occur in both men and women um, and the sex chromosomes are different in men and women. So if something's an autosomal dominant or co-dominant disorder, that means that it occurs both uh, in men and women with equal frequency. Um, and an allele is just a gene. So you would inherit um, one allele or gene for um, LP little a from each of your parents. The LP little a gene is found on chromosome number six. As I said, if you inherit one from each parent, so you have two different types of LP little a in your circulation. Um, you might get um, an LP little a with two Kringle four type two repeats from your dad, and you might get an LP little a with 40 um, Kringle um, four type two repeats from your mother. And interestingly, this for me was counterintuitive as I was learning about LP little a, but smaller LP little a types are easier for the liver to produce. So if a person um, has um, fewer Kringle four type two repeats, they'll actually have a higher LP little a level. And the next slide will help bring that home to you. So small isoforms or types um, have a higher LP little a concentration. Larger um, APOA isoforms have a lower concentration. So in the um, upper left-hand corner, we're looking at a small um, APOA isoform. It has four Kringle, um, four Kringle four type two repeats. Whereas um, in the lower right-hand corner, um, this is somebody that has 40 Kringle 4 type 2 repeats. And so the person in the upper left-hand corner is going to be um, in the um, is going to be in the 20% population um, who have elevated LP little a. And the person with those 40 Kringle 4 type 2 repeats is going to be in the 80% of the population that has um, less than a 50 milligram per deciliter level of LP little a. Next slide. So um, why might an elevated LP little a be beneficial? We really can't think of any reason for it to be beneficial right now in 2021. But from an evolutionary perspective, um, it's been suggested that an elevated LP little a might help with wound healing. Think about it in terms of clotting or reduce bleeding from childbirth. Those things could kill us. Um, so evolutionarily, it might have been beneficial. This um, slide is for Amanda Sheldon, who loves hedgehogs, um, but um, this is a little fun fact. LP little a evolved twice in evolution and is found only in hedgehogs, old, and that's a picture of a hedgehog, old world monkeys, and primates, including us. Um, humans have LP, elevated LP, can have an elevated LP little a. Next slide. So how do we diagnose an elevated LP little a? Next slide. There have been multiple guidelines recommending testing LP little a. Not every guideline recommends that everybody should have an LP little a tested once in their life. I happen to believe that they should. Um, and I point out that um, um, each of these is the Canadian um, Cardiovascular Society, the American Society of Apheresis, the American College of um, Cardiology, AHA. Um, they, they all have different, uh, slightly different um, readings. Um, but in, in the next slide, but I'm not ready for the next slide yet. In the next slide, we'll talk about what is considered normal, what is borderline, and what is high. Um, but I would like to point out that the European Society of Cardiology and the European Atherosclerosis Society um, defines an elevated LP little a as greater than 50, and they define a threshold where an elevated LP little a might equate to something similar um, to familial hypercholesterolemia. So if somebody has an LP little a of greater than or equal to 180 milligrams per deciliter, which equates to 430 nanomoles per liter, that would be a person who would be at, at, at as high risk of developing early cardiovascular disease as someone with heterozygous FH. Um, 
And then the, the National Lipid Association uses um, 50 milligrams per deciliter or 100 nanomoles per liter, which is the 80th percentile in um, Caucasians. Next slide. So um, what is a normal level? Less than 30 milligrams per deciliter or less than 76 um, nanomoles per liter. Elevated, um, as we've talked about, um, depends on what guideline you look at. Um, but everybody agrees that over 50 is elevated. And then depending on which guideline you read, greater than 125 nanomoles per liter or greater than 100 nanomoles per liter is considered um, elevated. Next slide. So is a person's LP little a level stable over time? So um, to waffle, um, the answer is yes and no. Um, so we do reach our adult LP little a level generally by age five. And so in general, a person's LP little a level um, is um, the same at five, 15, 25, 35, et cetera. But there are some exceptions. Um, LP little a levels rise at menopause sometimes quite substantially, um, and um, why? So estrogen is known to lower LP little a, and at menopause, estrogen declines. And so we may see as much as a 20% increase in LP little a, and for some people, even a little bit more. LP little a is also an acute phase reactant. So what does that mean? Um, it means that in times of stress, LP little a can elevate quite substantially. Um, so, for example, um, LP little a can rise in times of physical stress, um, such as um, a virus or an illness, a heart attack, surgery. So, um, we don't want to measure LP little a. Um, at, you know, if somebody comes in with a heart attack, we don't want to measure their LP little a, um, say, uh, 24 or 48 hours later, because it, it may well be elevated. I also would like to talk about a very timely um, cause of an elevation in LP little a. So we can sometimes see elevated LP little a in the setting of coronavirus. So if somebody um, experiences um, coronavirus and they already have a high LP little a, their LP little a may increase many fold. And um, this is a concern because um, we know that the coronavirus increases the risk for people who have this um, uh, situation called cytokine storm. And that can increase the risk of clotting and heart attacks. And so um, we've taken the step of um, having on our website a letter um, that should someone unfortunately um, know they have a high LP little a and think they might have COVID-19, they can print that off when they go to the emergency room um, to put um, the ER doctor or let the ER doctor know that this is a risk factor um, and that they might want to take special precautions. Next slide. Um, so the Friedwall equation is an equation that we use um, to calculate LDL. Um, and so in our labs, we measure total cholesterol, we measure triglycerides, and we measure HDL. But we use the Friedwall equation, which is really that the total cholesterol is equal to the LDL cholesterol plus the HDL cholesterol plus the triglycerides divided by five. Um, but when we think of LDL cholesterol, you might think that LDL cholesterol is all by itself. But when we're measuring LDL, really no matter how we measure LDL, um, we are getting LP little a in that measurement as well. Um, so LDL cholesterol plus LP little a cholesterol really equals the LDL cholesterol as we measure it. Next slide and I'll show you a... So this is a, a slide of a um, something called a beta quantification. So when you think about lipoproteins and we talk about HDL cholesterol, high density lipoprotein and LDL cholesterol, low density lipoprotein, you might wonder um, what do these terms mean? Well, they actually come from um, us spinning down um, a person's blood. And we spin down, a beta quantification spins over 18 hours and the lipoproteins layer um, in, in various spots. So the HDL is the high density lipoprotein. It, it layers at the very bottom, but LDL and LP little a layer out in the same band. Um, and so we measure them together. 
IDL is intermediate density lipoprotein, and that is um, layers out above. And VLDL and chylomicrons are very triglyceride rich lipoproteins, and they float at the top. Um, and so the Friedwall equation um, it has the LDL and the LP little a together. Um, next slide. Um, so this um, is a slide, I think it's um, really one of my only slides on both familial hypercholesterolemia, which is another autosomal dominant disorder um, characterized by very elevated LDL cholesterol. And so this talks about um, elevated LP little a and elevated FH, um, excuse me, and, and familial hypercholesterolemia. And what do these two things have in common? Well, number one, LP little a can increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and FH increases the risk of premature cardiovascular disease. And the fact that 30 to 50% of people who have familial hypercholesterolemia will also have a high LP little a. So when we think about um, how this um, factors out, if somebody has premature cardiovascular disease, and this is on the left-hand side, 162 people in this particular study um, published in clinical cardiology, and I'm only going to focus on this side. If you had 162 people with premature cardiac disease, that's women with cardiovascular disease uh, at, before the age of 60 or 65, and men before the age of 50 or 55, and you asked yourself, how does this balance out? Um, what percentage of people will have a high LP little a? What percentage of people will have familial hypercholesterolemia? And what percentage of people will have both? Well, so the lion's share, 59.3, um, um, probably have elevated LDL cholesterol and a number of other risk factors, cigarette smoking, diabetes, hypertension. 25.9% um, will have an elevated lipoprotein little a, that is greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter. We routinely say that um, uh, one in 10 premature myocardial infarctions or premature heart attacks is caused, caused by FH. And so 8.6% here is pretty close, um, will have familial hypercholesterolemia alone. And then there are people who, as we say, you know, really have two hits, have the double whammy of elevated LP little a plus familial hypercholesterolemia. And we'll see that in about 6.2% of people. So there really is a, a large percentage of people who have premature atherosclerosis, who will in fact um, have um, uh, lipid disorders, whether it be LP little a or familial hypercholesterolemia. Next slide. So um, the, there's an ICD-10 code um, for lipoprotein little a, and your doctor or your clinician may add this code to your medical record if you have a high LP little a. And we think it's very important to have ICD-10 um, codes, either for elevated LP little a or for a family history of elevated LP little a, because we can query the electronic medical record and ask questions of our own database um, when, we, when we do so. And also, as Catherine pointed out earlier, we have a very large um, national database um, that we have worked very hard to secure. It has information on um, over 300 million individuals. And uh, this um, database, um, we can query it um, for how many people have gotten a, a lipoprotein little a measurement, how many people have an elevated LP little a. So it's, it's very important in terms of us being able um, to do research on LP little a. Next slide. So what about um, LP little a lowering therapies? Do we have anything currently available? And next slide. So what are the impacts of certain LDL lowering um, therapies on LP little a? Um, and I know we've gotten a lot of questions about diet. And so I do wanna say upfront that diet does not impact LP little a and uh, dietary supplements do not impact LP little a uh, appreciably either. Um, some people have asked the question, um, does saturated fat um, lower LP little a? And the answer is it might lower LP little a slightly. But saturated fat is a very bad choice um, because saturated fat leads to, um, leads to down regulation of our LDL receptors. And what does that mean? That means 
that our LDL receptors on the surface of our liver are not able to remove LDL cholesterol effectively. So the more saturated fat we have in our diet, the more uh, elevation in LDL we're going to have. And LDL is very strongly correlated with cardiovascular disease. Um, we know from clinical trials that for every 40 milligrams, you lower your LDL, um, you can reduce your risk of a future cardiac event by 20%. So that's a big payoff. Um, so I would I hate to see people um, consuming a lot of saturated fat. Niacin can lower LP little a by about 20%, and we'll talk more about that in the next slide. Um, statins are known to raise LP little a slightly, but I cannot emphasize enough that statins are um, very, very important in terms of our ability to reduce cardiovascular events. When somebody has a high LP little a, I do use statins in my clinic so that I can lower their LDL dramatically. Um, I can lower their LDL by, you know, 80 milligrams per deciliter. That would equate to a 40% reduction in cardiovascular events. Um, so it's very important that we know that statins are our mainstay. Azetamide um, and benpidoic acid um, have no effect on um, LP little a. PCSK9 inhibitors um, such as evolocumab or alirocumab can lower LP little a by 15 to 30%. Estrogen can lower LP little a, and lomidipide, which is really used for people with homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, has a little bit of an LP little a reduction. I would point out that none of these um, that I've mentioned so far are indicated by the FDA for LP little a lowering. Lipoprotein apheresis is the exception. Lipoprotein apheresis, um, and I'm going to show you a slide on this um, shortly, um, can, um, in time average LDL reduction, can lower LP little a by about 35%. In clinical trials from before and after the use of lipoprotein apheresis um, for lowering uh, LDL and for lowering LP little a have shown a reduction in cardiovascular events. And I'll, I'll show you that. Um, is it one of our... Um, Somebody has said that aspirin can lower uh, LP little a by 25%. The data that I have seen on aspirin is about an 11% reduction. Um, but I will say that, and I was going to mention, this is expert opinion. It is There is not data in the literature to, um, to support this. But I would say that um, me as a uh, lipid specialist and my colleagues who are lipid specialists, I think that the physician who just um, flagged that in the chat um, would um, all agree that we routinely do recommend um, an aspirin, whether it's an 81 milligram or a 325 milligram aspirin to help um, decrease the clotting aspects of lipoprotein little a, but there have not been studies. Um, and so I, I think it's important um, that I mentioned that it's expert opinion. Next slide. So estrogen lowers LP little a, but data from the heart estrogen progesterone replacement study, um, uh, which was a secondary prevention, meaning in people who already had cardiovascular disease and the Women's Health Initiative primary prevention in women that didn't yet have cardiac disease, found that hormone replacement um, therapy increased adverse events, breast cancer, thrombosis, stroke. So we do not use estrogen to lower LP little a. Niacin, likewise, can lower LP little a by about 20%, um, but um, there was no benefit found, even in high LP little a subgroups, um, if they were already on a statin and nearly at their LDL goal. Um, niacin also has some other um, negative factors. It can increase blood glucose, it can increase GI bleeding, and it increases the risk of gout. So I, I, although I do know that some physicians use niacin for lowering LP little a, um, I don't routinely use it. Next slide. PCSK9 inhibitors, both evolocumab and alirocumab, can lower LP little a. Um, there were two major cardiovascular outcome studies with these PCSK9 inhibitors, the Fourier and the um, Odyssey outcomes. In both of these studies, LP little a reduction appeared to contribute um, to the ability of these agents to reduce cardiovascular events. But I would say that PCSK9 inhibitors are not yet FDA approved for LP little a reduction. Next slide. Um, this is lipoprotein apheresis. And um, this is uh, Kathy. Um, uh, and she is one of our FH advocates, our LP little a advocates. 
he undergoes LP little a um, or lipoprotein apheresis um, for the reduction of her LDL and her LP little a and has agreed to have her photo here. Um, lipoprotein apheresis is a process whereby we remove a person's blood um, from one arm and return it in the other. But in between, um, we um, use a plasma separator. We do this at Dartmouth, um, and I have a patient getting um, lipoprotein apheresis for her LP little a. Um, we use a plasma separator, and this separates plasma, which contains the lipoproteins from red cells. The plasma um, goes through these lipoabsorber columns, and this is the Konica um, lipoabsorber. That's the only one available in the United States. These columns have cellulose beads that are impregnate, impregnated with dextran sulfate. And dextran sulfate is negatively charged. ApoB, which is part of LDL and is part of LP little a, is positively charged. And it is basically sucked up um, by in these columns. And so then we have a waistline and um, we constantly go back and forth between these two life absorber columns during the three hour procedure, which can be done every week or every two weeks. Next slide. And this is what we see with lipoprotein apheresis. We see a, a, a plummeting, um, a 69% acute reduction, followed by a rebound in between apheresis. Um, so the time average reduction um, is about 35%. Next slide. Um, the life absorber, um, uh, 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 Lipoprotein apheresis is approved um, for people with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia who have an LDL greater than 100, an LP little a greater than 60, and either documented coronary disease or documented peripheral artery disease. Next slide. And what about clinical trials? What's going to be available potentially in the future? Next slide. Um, uh, Opasaran is an Amgen um, drug, uh, also known as AMG uh, 890. This is a small interfering RNA, and this is a, a relatively new class of drugs, and which will be going over in uh, lipoprotein 10, uh, 102. Um, so um, just suffice it to say, it is a very powerful um, type of mechanism for lowering LP little a. Amgen has initiated a 240 person phase two trials. So trials go phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, so phase one is first in humans, phase two, you've already worked out the bugs um, and you're looking um, at, you might be looking at different doses. And so this is a 240 person phase two dose, a phase two study using four different doses of Amgen 890 versus placebo. This study is already enrolling. It began enrolling in July of 2020 and should be complete by 2023. Um, if you, uh, in order to get into this um, study, you have to have an LP little a greater than 150 nanomoles per liter and evidence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Next slide. Pelicarsin, also known as TQJ230, um, is an antisense oligonucleotide, another class of drugs um, that I will be discussing in lipoprotein little a 102. Um, this is being developed by Novartis, and it can lower LP little a by 38 to 80 percent, depending on the dose. It can also lower um, that oxidized phospholipid as well, depending on the dose. This um, is currently enrolling um, a phase three trial, cardiovascular outcome trial called the HORIZON trial. Individuals have to have had previous atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, so heart disease, stroke, peripheral vascular disease in the last 10 years to enroll. Um, the dose that will be being used is 80 milligrams um, by subcutaneous injection um, once a month versus placebo. And it's estimated that this dose um, is likely to lower LP little a by about um, 80%. Um, in order to get into this study, you have to have an LP little a greater than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And we expect that it will continue for about four years or until um, there are 993 vascular events accrued. Next slide. And then um, silence therapeutics as um, SLN360. Um, this is a phase one trial. Um, so it will be enrolling 88 patients in nine cohorts using single, um, like a single dose um, or multiple doses ranging um, broad range from 30 to 900 milligrams. And if these agents, Pelicarsin, 
Oloparsaran, um, SLN360 proved safe and effective in reducing cardiac events. We might see these agents on the market um, within five years. And that's a, a shorter period of time than, than one would think. It happens pretty quickly. Next slide. So I'm going to stop here. I know this was a whirlwind, um, and um, I encourage you to go back and listen to it again if you didn't catch everything. I tried to repeat myself a few times, um, and I, I just want to say that we are um, really planning to do for LP little a what the FH Foundation has done um, for um, LDL cholesterol, for FH, familial hypercholesterolemia, and we need your help to do it. Thank you, Dr. McGowan. That was such an excellent presentation. And we have so many questions from the audience. Um, so far, I think over 30, 30 questions. So they keep coming in. You guys are doing a great job of using the Q&A and we'll stay on as long as possible to answer as many of your questions. And whatever we don't get to, we'll do a blog and some other materials so that we can continue as well as answer them in our next session together. So Mary, um, maybe you could start. Why do you think there's such a lack of awareness for LP little a within the medical community. One, one gentleman reported he could have avoided his heart attack and a few others have, have mentioned or maybe they, they can't get a cardiologist or another one of their doctors to pay attention to it. What, sh what should they do and, and why is this a problem? So I think that one of the problems is, is that lipoprotein little a is uh, complex um, and um, lipoprotein A until fairly recently um, didn't have a, a method of reducing it. We certainly have lipoprotein apheresis, which is FDA approved for reducing it. Um, and um, often uh, cardiologists, um, not to pick on cardiologists, but would say there's nothing to do about it. W what can I do? But I do think knowledge is very, very important. And I think getting the word out that this is present in one in five people and can increase the risk. I think over time, we are going to see more um, and more awareness. Um, we saw in the um, 2018 American Heart Association, American um, College of Cardiology guidelines, um, a, 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 um, a sort of a lifting up of LP little a. We've seen it in the NLA um, guidelines, but I think it's incumbent upon all of us um, to raise awareness and ask um, your physician if you have had an unexplained cardiovascular event or a family history of that, ask for an LP little a. Well, that's certainly, you know, a goal of, uh, of the FH Foundation to, to get out there and raise awareness and, and really make that connection, especially for people who've had um, family history of heart disease. And so one of some of the other questions are, you know, why does treatment focus on lowering LDL cholesterol? I think if you could, I know you went over this in your presentation, but maybe you could just underscore it a little bit more. Why LDL cholesterol? And if it isn't lowered enough um, while on a treatment, um, what should they, or if LP little a isn't lowered enough while on a treatment, why should they stay on? So maybe a two-parter there. Yeah, so um, we know that LP little a is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And at this point in time, um, other than uh, lipoprotein apheresis, um, we don't have a lot of other uh, therapies for LP little a. We know um, if somebody has a high LP little a, we can still reduce their cardiovascular risk by lowering their LDL, starting with statins. So lowering the LDL um, with a statin, um, every 40 milligrams per deciliter, you lower your LDL, you reduce your risk of cardiovascular events, regardless of whether or not you have high LP little a by about 20%. Um, if somebody has a high LP little a, I would really focus on um, getting rid of every other risk factor. You know, eat well, maintain a, um, a regular exercise, uh, lower your LDL cholesterol, make sure your HDL and triglycerides have been addressed, um, make sure your blood pressure is addressed, and if you have diabetes, treat that. Um, in the future, we will know the answer um, when we have these um, a small interfering RNA or antisense oligonucleotides, if they prove um, to be safe and effective at lowering LP little a and reducing cardiovascular risk, um, we may um, use a many pronged approach um, at getting the LP little a down. And perhaps a follow up to that, is there then, is there a specific goal in mind that you would have with a therapy? Um, one person asked him specific to PCS canines, but it could be any therapy, you know, is there a, a goal that they should be looking at? 
Well, we would love to have people, and I'm assuming, Amanda, you mean a, a goal for LP little a? I would, I, well, it was a little hard. I don't know if they meant a goal to lower the LP little a. Maybe they also, maybe there, maybe there's not a goal for LP little a, but there might be a goal for LDL cholesterol. And what would that be? Yeah. So, um, so we would love everybody to have an LP little a level less than 30 milligrams per deciliter. That would be great. Or less than 76 nanomoles per liter. That would be a, a wish. Um, but in terms of LDL, if somebody has a high LP little a and has an elevated um, and has, uh, has cardiovascular disease, we're going to aim to get their LDL down less than 70 and even lower would be better. Um, if somebody has a high LP little a but doesn't have cardiovascular disease, we'll aim to get their LDL down less than 100 and even lower is better there as well. So are there particular tests that someone can can take to assess their risk? Um, you know, scans have been met, calcium scans have been mentioned. Are there other tests that they can do to assess their risk? Yeah, that's a very good question, Amanda, because not everybody who has a high LP little a level gets into trouble with cardiovascular disease. And so if someone has a very high uh, LP little a level, and maybe they have a modestly elevated LDL cholesterol, and they come to my office and they say, how, how do I know what my risk is? I can first tell you that the um, we use a lot of risk calculators. Um, there's a risk calculator from the uh, American College of Cardiology, but it doesn't include in the calculator whether or not someone has a high LP little a. The one thing um, that I frequently recommend is a coronary calcium score. Um, if um, in our coronary arteries, we should have no calcium. Calcium is abnormal in coronary arteries. And so if somebody has an elevated coronary calcium score and we get a coronary calcium score um, by our race and our gender. And so you get a percentile where, where you stand. You could be in the 90th percentile. And so if somebody um, has a high LP little a level and they have an elevated coronary calcium score, I'm gonna treat them as though they already have cardiac disease because they're, um, they have plaque in their arteries. And so I would um, set their LDL goal at less than 70. And I know there's a, a lot of debate in the medical community um, in, in, in FH about this, but what about an LP little a? What about if the calcium risk score is, is zero? Would you still be as concerned or how would you assess risk in that, that case in sort of a general case? Yeah, so the, um, the coronary calcium score, um, in, 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 this is in the American, um, Heart Association, American College of Cardiology 2018 guidelines. A coronary calcium score of zero could be used to delay therapy, but probably shouldn't be used to never think about therapy. Um, so if somebody is really on the fence about um, going on uh, lipid lowering therapy and they truly have a coronary calcium uh, of zero, um, then, uh, and, and, and this, I, I should specify, this would be a middle-aged person um, because people can have high LP little a and high LDL in their 30s and still have no coronary calcium. So it's not really that discriminatory um, in, um, in, in the uh, younger ages. Um, so if somebody's a middle-aged person and they have an absolute zero coronary calcium score, and that's the only normal coronary calcium score, we might delay therapy by a year or two, um, but I would still encourage people um, to be treated. And so um, uh, another question, um, we, you talked about how it's inherited. And so at what age would you recommend, you know, offspring of, um, of a parent with elevated or high LP little a get checked? Yeah, so I, I would, um, this is my opinion, um, because we reach our adult level by five, if there is a adult parent that is known to have a high LP little a, maybe known to already have cardiovascular disease, anytime after the age of five. All right. And um, one of the other questions, I'm going to get to some of the other technical, uh, the clinical questions, but um, someone asked, you know, how do, how does the FH Foundation get their data in our, in our da national database? Um, is it, you know, th through lab companies? Is it, do people send it in? And maybe you could talk just a little bit about the FH Foundation's national database and then, and then what we also collect in the registry. Yeah, so um, we have two major um, sources of, of data. Um, the National Registry 
is a registry um, that marries um, uh, um, data that is um, procedure codes, um, surgical codes, um, diagnosis codes um, from a large database, and it marries it um, with data from uh, two large lab databases. I'm not allowed to say where these came, where these come from, but it is a, um, it's a very valuable resource that the FH Foundation has invested um, a tremendous amount of money acquiring so that we can ask questions, research questions. Um, we can ask questions about uptake of medications um, and what happens when people don't get medications. For example, um, Kelly Myers, our chief technology officer, looked at what happens when people don't get PCSK9 inhibitors when they really need them and found that there's an increased risk of cardiovascular events. Um, we use this data to look at um, trends. We use this data to look at who's being, uh, in aggregate, who's being treated and who's not. Um, the other database that we have um, is um, a database that is part of our familial hypercholesterolemia registry. Um, and this registry um, is a registry of um, nearly 40 sites, um, large academic sites, large um, research sites, large clinical um, uh, community um, hospitals. And uh, we have uh, people at each of these sites entering data on people with familial hypercholesterolemia. But as I mentioned, 4,500 people that we follow longitudinally, we use that data um, to uncover disparities in care by gender, by race. Um, and we also um, look at um, lipoprotein little a. So we have 4,500 people. And I mentioned earlier that um, 30 to 50% of people with familial hypercholesterolemia will also have a high lipoprotein little a. And so um, we have almost 2,000 um, patients who have an LP little a in our registry. And we're certainly looking at that and looking at how people who have both high LDL and high LP little a fare in terms of risk. All right, thank you for that. And um, we had a question, if we knew why aortic valves are affected by LP little a, but not um, other valves such as the mitral valve. Yeah, so um, that's a, an excellent question and one that I don't know the answer to, um, but there is um, much more force um, of blood going through the, the mitral valve. There's probably more turbulence, um, but I um, am not an expert on that. So I, I, I don't know the answer. All right, and no problem. We'll, we'll get to that answer in a, in a, in a future. Um, so I think there was a question from Dr. Tayek, and I hope I didn't mispronounce his name, but does anyone know if you measure a direct LDL is the LP little a also included? And then I think there's been some questions on like how expensive is this? Do you have to go to a normal lab or a specialty lab to get a to get a test? Unfortunately, um, when somebody has a direct LDL, it's also LP little a. So that 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 workaround um, does not um, does not work. Um, but um, because I think you measure the direct LDL um, by virtue of ApoB and both LP little a and LDL have, have ApoB. Um, no, um, I, I order LP little a all the time. Um, I will warn you that sometimes insurance companies um, refuse to pay for it. They say um, it's a um, uh, experimental um, uh, laboratory, um, but it's, it's available everywhere. And I think that um, it's our job um, to raise awareness and the importance of getting it measured. Great. It's not that expensive. That's, that's great to hear. Um, so um, we talked a lot about our little Danish friends, our Kringles. And so um, just a clarifying question, if you have larger APOA, which results in lower LP little a concentration, does the risk of heart disease decrease? Yeah, because you would have a lower concentration. Um, so you'd have a, a much lower level. So those would be the people, um, you know, there are some people who we measure their LP little a and it's two or it's, you know, some labs just reported as less than eight. Um, and so um, those would be people who presumably um, have the large isoforms. But someone in the elevated category, you know, is there, uh, is there a way to differentiate or at that point, once you're elevated, you're, you're really elevated? I know that's a basic question. Yeah, I would say in general, if you have a significant elevation, you probably have the small isoforms, the small this smaller number of Kringle um, uh, uh, 
for um, type two repeats. Okay. And some more clarifying questions, and hopefully the team will tell me if I'm missing some other big ones, but um, will people, um, I think it said, um, so if, will people affected with an elevated LP little a see a reduction in LDL when treated with, I guess it's it, it, ASOs, is that aspirin? Antisense that? oligonucleotides. Oh, okay. Um, so so the antisense oligonucleotide directed at LP little a. Um, so, so the question is, will they see a drop in apolipoprotein a, 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 or will they see a drop in LDL? Drop in, sorry, I lost it. I think it was LDL. Okay, so, so there was an antisense oligonucleotide that was on the market called um, mipomersin. Um, and mipomersin lowered both LDL and lowered LP little a, lowered LP little a by about 29%. That drug had a fair number of side effects and it's no longer available in the United States. But the antisense oligonucleotide that we're talking about, Pelicarsin um, from Novartis, um, that can lower LP little a by up to 80%. And it also has a small impact on LDL, very small impact on LDL, but, but can lower LP, um, LDL as well. And um, we're going to do an upcoming webinar, not just on LP delay, we'll probably do an upcoming webinar just on statins, but I think, is there anything, we just get a lot of questions, there's a lot of even questions in this chain about, you know, well, why statins, and I, I might might be worried about statins and side effects, and, and, and how do you at least speak with your um, patients about these questions? Yeah, so um, statins are um, a drug people love to hate, um, but statins, actually, we have more data on statins than any other class of drugs for uh, cardiovascular risk reduction. Um, there have been multiple cardiovascular outcome trials, and statins um, do lower LDL dramatically. If somebody um, has a an elevated LDL, somebody, for example, has familial hypercholesterolemia, the recommendation is high dose of high intensity statins. Um, so 20 or 40 of rosuvastatin, um, 40 or 80 of atorvastatin. Um, I try to push the statins as much as I can. Um, if somebody has difficulty um, related to the statins, I would supplement with azetamibe. Um, and then we can add other agents in, PCSK9 inhibitors, benthodoic acid. Um, they all have a role. But the data for statins is, is so profound. And very importantly, the economics. Um, you know, Statins cost pennies a day. Um, so nobody's getting rich on statins, um, you know, at, at, at this point in time, they're all generic. Um, and so I, I, I think that it's important to use um, medications that are going to be cost effective. Um, for every 40 milligrams, you lower your LDL with a statin, you reduce your risk of a cardiac event by 20%. Thank you for that. And so I'm gonna ask some questions related to LP little a and high cholesterol. Um, First, just basic question, at what level of cholesterol, do, does, does someone with high L, LP little a always have high cholesterol? And at what level should they be tested? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Now think about it, you could have a very low LDL and you could hide a very high LP little a in that LDL. So say you have an LDL of 40. Now, not many people have an LDL of 40 and you have an LP little a of 240. Divide 240, this is milligrams per deciliter, by three, and that's 80. You might have an LDL of 120. And you know, that's that's it's higher than we'd like. We'd like it less than 100. But you can hide a very high LP little a in a relatively normal LDL. And so say somebody comes in um, to the emergency room and they have an LDL of 120 and they have had a cardiac event and they're you know 45 years old, um, that should trigger um, getting. And an LP little a measurement. Maybe not, um, you know, I talked about LP little a is an acute phase reactant, so it can go up at the time of a heart attack. But certainly once somebody's, um, you know, eight weeks out from um, a heart attack or um, immediately remembering to do it um, in the ER, um, that, that could be very helpful. And um, I mean, you talked a little bit, but is, is that really the only symptom of high LP little a? It, are there any symptoms that that don't involve a visit to the ER and um, possibly, you know, an urgent heart attack or, or stroke? 
So Amanda, that you know, that's a very good question. And when we think about um, LDL, um, we think about it as the silent killer. And LP little a is very much the same. Um, you don't have any symptoms of a high LP little a. You don't have any symptoms of a high LDL until um, you have a cardiovascular event. So that's why it's so important to be proactive. If you have a family history of cardiovascular disease, um, get your lipid profile, um, know what your lipid profile is. And it might be that your LDL is fine, but your LP little a is high. It might be that your triglycerides are high and your HDL is low. Um, you know, there are many different lipoprotein abnormalities that can get us into trouble. Um, but I say knowledge is power. So we should you know, get our lipid profile. And certainly, I, I think everybody deserves a lipoprotein little a at some point in time. Earlier, and um, another person, you know, just asked, so I, I, I know that we have varying guidelines in the United States about getting one at least once in a lifetime. I know we, we, we sort of strongly believe that in order to understand and really manage the risk and, and be empowered, how often then should you get your LP little a checked? Yeah, so I would say that, as I mentioned, you reach your adult level at five, and then each time you measure it, it's going to be very similar. I know somebody sent in a, a question that said um, that after they had, I think, their gallbladder out, um, it was very high. But remember, it's an acute phase reactant, so don't get it measured then. Um, so get it measured one time in your life. Um, and then for women, I would advocate that postmenopausally, um, women get a, a second LP little a measure. Um, and you, it's not going to go down at this point um, with lifestyle measures or appreciably with um, any um, intervention that we have other than lipoprotein apheresis. Um, so, um, you know, if somebody's getting lipoprotein apheresis, we sometimes measure it. Uh, but and then in the future, when we have um, agents aimed at lipoprotein little a, um, I think we'll be measuring it more. Very similar to the way we measure um, LDL. And, I, and I, I believe you gave the fact earlier, but could you talk a little bit about the overlap between FH and elevated LP little a and, you know, what maybe even a follow up question from someone in the audience is like, if, if, if LP little a can raise that be raised after menopause, then what might they do to continue to protect themselves or to help themselves, especially if they already have um, cardiovascular disease. Okay, so um, we, kn we know that one in um, five people have an elevated LP little a. So 20% of uh, worldwide um, has an elevated LP little a. When we think about people with familial hypercholesterolemia, um, we um, know that somewhere between 30 and 50% of people who have familial hypercholesterolemia also have an elevated LP little a. Um, why that is, um, I, I, I can't say. Um, but we know that a high LP little a is much more common in people with FH than it is in the general population, even though elevated LP little a is common in the general population. You might think that using estrogen postmenopausally, which would keep your LP little a down a little bit, might be wise. But as I mentioned in the women's health study, um, the um, what was found was elevated um, uh, using um, hormone replacement therapy uh, postmenopausally increase the risk of breast cancer, increase the risk of stroke, and increase the risk of thrombosis. Um, so uh, we don't routinely use um, estrogen postmenopausally to lower LP little a. And, and what about um, individuals who are younger? I know in in, in FH we can begin treating um, children with statins if if they needed it even as early as the age of eight. What about a, a teenager or a young adult with um, high LP little a? When do you start to consider treatment? Well, um, since um, there are you know not. Um, therapies available right now. Um, remember, um, to get to be approved for lipoprotein apheresis for a high LP little a, um, you have to have had cardiovascular disease, an LDL greater than 100, an LP little a greater than um, 60 in a person with familial hypercholesterolemia. So um, there aren't therapies um, to lower LP little a in children. Um, and so what would we do? We would look at the child's LP little a, look at their LDL and really look closely at their family history. 
if there was a very strong family history of really early cardiovascular disease, um, you could make a case um, if that child had an elevated LDL to consider um, using a statin. Um, in that child, but but that would you know be an individual decision um, with the um, pediatric lipid specialist and um, that child's family. And and so we talk about this at the FH Foundation a lot. Is there is there can you go too low with LDL cholesterol? Um, should people consider adding more treatments if they're on one, adding another? Um, so what what is what is some perspective on that? Well, one of the things that came up in one of our, our summits, um, so I don't think your um, LDL can really be too low, but one of the things that came up in one of our summits was, um, I think Dan Rader mentioned um, that um, uh, Dr. Broomwald, who is the, you know, the father of cardiology, um, he basically says, bring it on. I'll take any um, lipid lowering medicine because I want to get my LDL down around 20. Um, so, um, you know, he's a, 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 a world-renowned cardiologist, um, but I'll tell you in terms of um, both our, um, when we're born, when we're born, we're making cells at a faster rate than any time in our life, and our LDL is at about 30. Um, there are also genetic um, conditions where people have very low LDL. Um, I'm thinking of loss of function mutations with PCSK9. I'm thinking of something called hypobeta lipoproteinemia. And as long as you have a little LDL, um, you're, you're fine. Um, people can have LDL levels as low as you know, 15, 20, and they'll be perfectly fine. Um, there is a condition called a beta lipoproteinemia where you don't have any LDL, and that gives you um, issues, neurological issues, um, and uh, blood issues. So um, I, I don't think you should have none, but I think you could have, get away with very little. Well, thank you for that. So, you know, we're going to end the questions here and we're going to invite everyone, if you haven't visited our site, familylipoproteinA.org. Um, I know many of you are already a part of the Facebook um, discussion group and um, we invite you to check out some of our resources. We do have um, a blog on treatments. We have a way to search for clinical trials. And all of this, as again, we, we really want you all to get involved. These questions have been amazing. We're going to follow up with more blogs to answer the questions. We're going to follow up, I think, with LPLA 102. We really need you um, all who have joined us today to be a part of our community to, to help us determine what resources are needed. We're going to be out there advocating. We need volunteers. We um, have an um, advocacy training um, coming up. And so please um, connect with us. You can email us. You can um, come to our website. And um, I just really want to thank you, um, Dr. McGowan. You are a wealth of information. I'm so blessed. I've learned so much um, from working beside you. And um, we're, we're, we're really happy to have you um, here um, answering all of our questions. And thank all of you who joined and helped um, add to our discussion with all of your thoughtful and amazing detailed questions. We're just so happy um, to have been able to present this to you today and um, we'll get the recording out as soon as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks everybody for coming.